Welcome to Conversations That Matter. Mike, today we're having another of our conversations with an eminent scientist from Princeton University. Let's talk a little bit about who our guest is today. Uh, today we'll hear from Freeman Dyson. He's a 91-year-old mathematical physicist, one of the most renowned scientists in the United States, been around for six decades. He's an extraordinary mind. Ex I, I, I'm talking to one of our previous guests who went, <laughs> you're talking to who? Like, to say that he has a big brain would be an understatement. That's right. And this is someone who actually works in the same building uh, at Princeton that Einstein worked in. And interestingly enough, not only works in that building, but he was actually there when Einstein was there. I know. It's extraordinary. You go into the building, there's this bust of Albert Einstein, and the address is one Einstein Drive, and it dawns on you that this is a place where some rather extraordinary thinking happens. Extraordinary, and in his own words, subversive science. Contrarian. Contrarian, opinion. yeah. Freeman Dyson believes we ought to be using science as a way to upend the apple cart, and particularly teach young people that science can be an act of rebellion, uh, positive rebellion, you know, to push against now, poverty. Now, there's many people who are on, on, on the climate uh, change side of the equation who are advocating that we're in trouble, and they say that science is support, supports that. They're not going to be so happy with the conversation with Freeman Dyson. Well, uh, Freeman Dyson is probably someone that comes out on more of the neutral side uh, in terms of climate change. He obviously uh, acknowledges uh, that there is rising carbon in the, in the environment. And that the temperature has gone up. The temperature has gone up. But I think his approach is to say we, we don't know enough. And, you know, we need to focus on things in the world that we know enough about to change. It, it, you're right. Not knowing enough. He says, well, I know the guy who designed the first computer model that all other models are based on. Like, he knows the guy, and he knows that the model can't mirror what is in climate, and, and this is his point. And so he says, yes, we've had this effect, but it's the predictive model that is difficult for him to embrace. That's right, and which is what makes his voice on this issue, particularly as somewhat of a contrarian, even that much more important and, and pivotal, really, in the entire debate. Oh, there are people who are not going to be happy with what Mr. Dyson has to say, um, but it's a conversation that we believe was worth having. Let's go to that now. This time from the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton University. Joining me now is Freeman Dyson. Mr. Dyson, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Man-made climate change. Where are we at from your perspective? Is it incontrovertible science or are we being led down a path that you are suspicious of? Well, first of all, there is man-made climate change. I mean, that's it's a question how much and is it good or bad? And there are all sorts of questions. The fact that it exists is not a question. Certainly there is some effect of humans on climate and we have to try to find out what it is. All I would say is, first of all, we don't understand the details. It's probably much less than is generally claimed. And much of the most important thing is that there are huge non-climate effects of carbon dioxide which are overwhelmingly favorable, which are not taken into account. To me, that's the main issue, that the, the Earth is actually growing greener. And this has been actually measured from satellites. The whole Earth is growing greener as a result of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So it's increasing agricultural yields, it's increasing the, the forests, it's increasing all kinds of, of growth in, in the biological world. And that's more important and more certain than the effects on climate. Well, this is where you started your research, isn't it? In the effects of CO2 on vegetation. Yes. Uh, and over the years, what have you found? Well, it's in increasing just more or less as we expected. I, I uh, started working on this 37 years ago, and uh, at the time when there were, we, we thought the effects were maybe about 10%, and uh, now it's probably more like 25% after 35 years. It's, it, it's essentially what we expected. 
carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has gone up by 40% in that time or something like that. Yeah, up to about 400 parts per million at the moment. Uh, yeah. Just shy of that, I think. Yes, about half of that has gone into raising vegetation. So vegetation has increased on the average by around 20%. And that's observed. And of course, it's extremely important. It actually is enormously beneficial both to food production and also to, to the bio, bio, biodiversity, preservation of species and everything else that's good. So uh, I, and the, 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 the remarkable thing is that these effects, which have nothing to do with climate, effects of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are so much easier to measure than the effects on climate and so much more certain. Well, I know that in a greenhouse where there is, uh, you know, industrial uh, growing of plants for food production, the uh, carbon dioxide uh, parts per million is up around 1,200 parts per million. We, we know that it works in an actual greenhouse, but there was a, a considerable amount of concern as to whether or not that would actually translate into the atmosphere globally. And you're saying that the evidence is in that, it, that the benefit exists in the world at large as well. Yes, on the average. I mean, of course, it's not true everywhere. And you can, uh, you can find cases where it doesn't work and cases where it does work. If, if you look at the details, it depends on what other nutrients are available. Of course, if, if, if the growth of plants is limited by not having enough nitrogen, then giving it more carbon won't help. And, and so most of the time there is enough nitrogen and giving it more carbon does help. So it's understandable that the effects vary from place to place. You're also on record uh, as saying that we will be able to genetically re-engineer trees to help absorb any excess amount of, uh, of carbon that's in the environment. And I, and I was reading recently about precision genetic engineering so that we can go, we can splice right into the gene and say, this is the particular co component. Do you see this being uh, uh, like an alternative if we get to the point where we go, the level of CO2 in the atmosphere is, is something that we're uncomfortable with? Yes, but that's in the very long run. And so I, I think people have to understand there are some things which are true right now, other things which will be true in 100 years, and other things which will be true in 500 years. And that makes a big difference. So what you're talking about, so genetic engineering of the, 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 the plants all over the earth, uh, I would say it, it probably at least a hundred years from now. It certainly will be important in the long run, but it's a, it's a very long run. So one shouldn't think of that as something we're going to be doing in the next 10 years. So if I come back to the, the question of CO2 in the atmosphere, we've seen about a 40% increase, I believe, over the last 130 some odd years uh, uh, of measurement. Is, is that correct? That's accurate, yes. But we haven't seen a 40% increase in temperature. Uh, so the, uh, the rise of CO2 doesn't necessarily uh, correlate to, to, temp to temperature change. Uh, do you understand why all of a sudden then there is such concern about CO2 increases and what it's going to do to, to global temperatures? Well, I don't try to impute motives to people. I mean, I disagree with people very strongly, but I don't say that they're evil because they disagree with me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not talking about, I, th I think, I don't want to analyze other people's motives. There certainly is an enormous religion in which there are lots of true believers who think that climate change is evil and that we're going to run into big catastrophes if we don't do something drastic. And that's a sort of a belief system which exists. But I don't understand it and I don't pretend to understand their motives. But so much of that belief is predicated upon models that are uh, represented, computer models that take uh, data uh, from weather stations around, uh, around the world, and they say that this modeling uh, demonstrates that this projection is going to work. This, of course, I've always been fighting against, 
the idea that the models actually are good predictors. And my friend, um, Yoshiro Minabe, he's a Japanese climate expert who lives here in Princeton. And he was actually the first person who ever did climate models with increased carbon dioxide just to see what it would do. And, and he found the warming and it, it was less than is now fashionable, but anyway, there was some warming. Is, is this the modeling that goes back to the late 60s? Yes. Yes, okay, I was reading about that. So anyway, Wanabe always said, and still he says, that uh, these climate models are excellent tools for understanding climate, but they're very bad tools for predicting climate. And the reason is simple, that uh, they are models which have only a few of the factors in them that may be important. So you can vary one thing at a time, so you can help, it helps to understand if you vary one thing at a time and see what happens in particularly carbon dioxide. But there's a whole lot of things they leave out. And that's why they're no good for prediction. That the real world is far more complicated than the models. And that is the challenge, isn't it? Well, I, I don't say it's, it's a challenge. I don't think any of these models can ever be really predictive because climate is too complex. Yes. And there's too many factors at work. Yes, and you just cannot model everything. It's, uh, it's just, it's, it's way, way out of sight. I have interviewed uh, other scientists about climate and I've asked them what the effect of the sun is. And they said, well, the sun has a convenient excuse. Its temperature hasn't changed. Is that true? It's true the sun's temperature doesn't change but its activity does change. Its activity, meaning sunspots and magnetic storms, they changed with the 11-year cycle very strongly. And we see an effect on climate. There, there's a young man here, in fact, called Nir Shaviv, an Israeli, who has actually studied this. He actually finds a very direct effect of this solar cycle, the sunspot cycle, on the climate. So it, uh, it is important. It has nothing to do with the temperature of the sun. It has more to do with the, the radiation that uh, makes its way into the Earth's atmosphere. Yes. It's uh, mostly the cosmic rays, the high energy radiation. It doesn't have anything to do with the actual temperature of the sun. And it's that uh, ability of that energy to be able to penetrate Earth's atmosphere and warm the atmosphere that, we're, that we live in. Well, it's a complicated situation. I mean, that, uh, Shaviv uh, uh, has studied the evidence, and the evidence is clear that this activity of the sun is having an effect. And of course, there was a big uh, uh, additional piece of evidence, which was the Little Ice Age, which happened in the 17th century, which also co coincided with the time when the sun went to sleep for about 70 years. There was a thing called the Maunder Minimum when the sunspots just didn't happen. And at the same time, there was a very cold climate in Europe. So there's a fair, that's fairly strong evidence of correlation. But there's much more direct evidence now from modern observations. So the, 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 the correlation is certainly there. Exactly how the activity of the sun influences the climate is not completely clear. It has something to do with cosmic rays, but it's not direct heating of the atmosphere. It's probably an effect on clouds, and, but we don't know for sure. What led me on my path to try and understand where the truth was I, is I watched Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth. Yes. And in that movie, he says, when you take water vapor out of the equation, CO2 makes up about 30% of the Earth's greenhouse gases. That's true. And so I decided to, yeah, it is true, isn't it? Because I started to look at that statement and I went, okay, well, how much does, and, and that led me to ask, how much does water vapor, uh, like what role is it? And, and back came this astounding number of 90%. Yes. And I went, well, how can you take water vapor out of the equation? You can't. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's, I mean, it's all right if you want to talk about Mars. Because there is no water vapor. Right. 
how did we get to focus on CO2 as being this tipping point, the, the culprit? Because it's something we do ourselves, and th that's what makes it special. It's, it is human activity. The fact is that CO2 is so beneficial in other ways, it would be crazy to try t to reduce it. I have been reading recently, I have tried to read the IPCC report on, yes. uh, cl on climate change, and I can't do it. It's yes. beyond my ability to comprehend what it's about. Yes. Um, there are so many other things that you have to understand. But one thing that struck me is that there is recognition in the report that there are adjustments made on temp temperature re reportings uh, from a variety of different stations around the world. Are you aware of this? Yes. Why do they do that? Well, because the, the measuring temperature is a, a, a difficult thing. It is uh, all sorts of local effects. I mean, the, 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 the original measurements of carbon dioxide by Keeling were done at the top of the mountain in, in Hawaii, in right. Mauna Kea, uh, to get away from human influences, that's where he measured it, and that was a very good move. It, it, that's why the measurements are actually very reliable. Because they continue to monitor from there. Yes, and yeah. that's the way to do it. But the trouble is, if you want to, 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 to measure the average temperature of the Earth, which is a very poorly defined thing anyway, uh, you have to have lots of measuring stations and the local influences are very strong. So they try to correct for local influences. If somebody builds a building nearby, it changes the temperature and all kinds of, of vegetation, of course, also can change. So there's every reason for not trusting those measurements. Is science in the business of predicting things, or is it in the, in the business of observing, recording, measuring, telling us uh, what we know at this point, and then leading us to the next stage of discovery? Well, it does all of those things. I mean, we've, been, we've done pretty well with predicting the weather up to a week. I mean, that's it's remarkable how, how good the yeah. weather forecasting is. It has really improved enormously as a result of computer models. Up to about five days, those things really work. Mm -hmm. What they don't do is predict what's going to happen 10 years from now or even... Or two weeks from now. Even next year, yes. Yeah. It's, <laughs> so it's, a, it's an art as much as a science, and, but it's, it's improving as time goes on. How did Benjamin Franklin, through the almanac, farmer's almanac, get so good at predicting weather then? <laughs> well, of course, there are always people who can do it better. And, and if you're out in the open air, it does help. And, and <laughs> <laughs> so as you look forward, I, I think that one of the challenges for all of us, no matter where we are in life right now, to, to look 100 years out, we, don't, we won't be there to see what the result was. Exactly. And so how do we know? Well, you can, some things you can be pretty sure of. And, and uh, the fact is that carbon dioxide will increase. We will continue to burn oil and coal. And probably it does us good. The Earth will get greener as a result. What do you say to people who uh, want to have the same level of optimism that you do about the future, but they're afraid to, uh, to go against uh, the common uh, or the current um, embracing of uh, global warming and potential catastrophe? How do you, how do you give to, to viewers and, and the future this sense of, uh, of optimism about our, our world that you well, have? I mm -hmm. think that if you talk to Chinese and Indians and people from Asia generally, they don't feel uh, pessimistic at all. I mean, generally speaking, uh, those countries in particular, things have improved so much in the last 50 years that they see continued improvement. So that this, uh, this sort of mood of doom and gloom is, I would say, only it, it, in, in, particularly in the academic com communities and uh, particularly in the Western societies. 
So, and I, it's, it, so I, I don't think it's at all universal. It happens that the media have gone along with it. But uh, I think that the, the general public has a lot more common sense. I, I noticed uh, that you also have Cool It on the table here uh, yes. <laughs> in anticipation of our conversation. Yes. Why did you bring out this book? Well, it, I think it's the best general summary I've seen in, in, in a way. I mean, he's an economist, not a scientist, but uh, I think he's very sound. Mm -hmm. And it certainly makes a pretty good case on, on economic grounds. Now, he's been attacked, of course, as well. Oh, of course. And, and Dr. Willie Soon uh, just recently has been uh, vilified. Yes. No, I think the, the fact is that uh, you ought to enjoy being in the minority, and, and that's, uh, that's the way I feel. I, but of course, I'm lucky because I'm retired. I don't have to fear of losing, losing my job. And, and <laughs> Is any science incontrovertible? Because you get people, there is a fellow in Vancouver who is a well-respected lover of nature, uh, and he has been explaining nature to Canadians for decades now, who is at the point where he says, if you don't believe in man-made climate change, then you should go to jail. I mean, literally speaking, it's true. I mean, man-made climate change certainly is, is, is real. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt it's real. And just a question is how much and how, whether it's good or bad. And those are quite separate questions. And from your perspective? I would say it's, it's on the whole good. And also it's not as, 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 it's not as large an effect as most people imagine. And all in all, uh, you remain optimistic about our future. Absolutely. I mean, because the reason for that is I grew up in the 1930s and things, uh, everything was so much worse then. So, so, that's, I think, the primary reason why I'm an optimist. And we never expected to survive. At all? In the 30s, yeah. I mean, we saw World War II coming and Hitler, and, the, uh, and we knew about biological weapons. We expected to have anthrax, anthrax bombs. And everything I, I look at has improved compared with the 1930s. So it's a question where you start. And, well, thank you very much for taking the time to do this. Thank you. I appreciate it very much.